Hello and welcome to Ask GC Anything. This week we're answering your questions on mental fitness, smooth pedalling and why team mechanics sit in the back of the car and not the front. Good questions then. And a little bit of everything. Don't forget for your chance to be in with a free three month subscription to Zwift, use the hashtag AskGCNTraining and for anything non-training related use the hashtag TalkBack when you leave a question you or can. just pop it in the comments box. Exactly. Yeah. First up then, we have a question from Eduardo Lorenzo. Any tips on how to make sure both legs are exerting the same amount of effort other than using a power meter? I often feel that my right leg is more tired than my left leg. Well, that's quite a good question. Actually, I think most people have an imbalance in leg strength. And while we'd all love to be symmetrical, most of us aren't. I remember discussing this with um, some uh, sports scientists on a training camp once and uh, they point out that everyone is asymmetric and even if you can pedal evenly with both legs at low power normally when you're really at your threshold working hard one leg is stronger than the other normally the longer leg I think yeah. and yeah almost no one is symmetrical but if you're really worried about it and you don't have a power meter that shows both sides what you could do is head to a gym where they have a what bike or similar which could show you both sides um, and then if there is a big imbalance that's giving you problems you can work to correct it for example you can do single leg strength exercises you can work on your core try and get the right cadence for you and um, there's lots you can do but single leg strength exercise is the way to correct it and to find out I'd yeah, head to a gym or uh, a local testing centre where they can measure that imbalance for you. Yeah and, well, and whilst you're at it you could always check out Sai's Pedal Smoothly video that's playing in the background right now. So when our pros are pedalling in their less smooth way what they're effectively doing is putting out more power on the downstroke and then less for the rest of the way around the pedal stroke. Except there is one thing, and that is that we can't differentiate between positive force and negative force using this test. So effectively, we can't split the difference between pushing down and then unweighting on the back of the pedal stroke. Meaning that Marco Mercato could, in theory, actually be pulling up on the pedal stroke, which would explain why there is that greater discrepancy between peak power and average power per pedal stroke. Staying on the subject of pedaling, Joseph Campbell asks, I keep reading about mixing in high cadence work into my indoor training. What is the purpose of this? Well, the cliche is spin to win, Joseph, but I hate that cliche. What yeah. do you think, Chris? <laughs> well, you're, you're not wrong because actually science shows that the most efficient cadence is around 60 RPM and on quite short cranks as well to do with oxygen use and everything like that. But science also has shown that by including some really high bursts of cadence, you help make your muscle contractions more efficient and the coordination of everything is well, it's more in tune and it's actually a really useful thing to do. So you're not looking to do loads of really like long efforts at a high cadence, but really short ones at a really, really high cadence, so like up towards 170 or more, yep. is proven to be really good. And the thing I've noticed anecdotally is that cadence is a very personal thing. So some people prefer, like the Jan Ulrichs prefer to ride at a very low cadence. And I was raced at quite a high cadence. I had shorter cranks as well. And there's, there's no correct cadence. You do what's best for you and what you do best at. But often people find that if they train at the limit, so do like big gear efforts and high cadence efforts, that that can help your pedaling technique to improve basically. So yep. that's probably one of the reasons. And if you want to see further on this, you can check out the, Jam the video that James did with Dan and Oscar. And they're pedaling pretty fast. Session number two is like a micro interval session that is focused on cadence. So you want to get that same 15 minute warm up in, at which point you're going to start your first block where for the first 30 seconds you're at 130 RPM, which is really going some, and then for the next 30 seconds you're down at 90. You can repeat this four to six times per block and between, you're gonna have a slightly longer recovery of between five and six minutes. Try to get in four to five blocks per session before you do your cool down. Next up, we have a question from Christopher Jenkins. Hi GCN, can you help with any tips for mental fitness? In this, I mean being able to suffer and deal with it or manage the effort you're trying for. Many times this has let me down over actual fitness, particularly on a hill climb when I didn't have the mental strength to cope with a sustained maximal effort when I could have pushed more. Well, I think that's an amazing question. It's mm. an absolutely fascinating topic. And I don't know about you, but I've certainly seen athletes who weren't necessarily the fittest, but they were mentally the strongest and they could suffer the best and uh, and win over athletes who were physically fitter. So it's a great question. And there's so much interesting theories and scientific evidence out there about this. Basically, your mind is incredibly powerful and it's not a muscle, but it's a bit like a muscle in that you can train it to suffer more. And it's something that I notice through the season is that if I do enough hard sessions, I get better at the suffering. The thing is though, that your brain wants and needs to protect your body from damaging yourself. So um, just in the same way that your brain protects you from putting your hand on a hot stove, uh, it protects you from overexerting yourself and literally 
training or racing yourself to death. So those pain receptors are important, but obviously you want to override them to a certain extent so that you go faster and there's a balance to be had there. Um, there are lots and lots of tips and tricks for trying to push through that pain barrier. It's unlikely you'll kill yourself, so don't panic. Uh, what, what about you? What tips did you use, to, techniques yeah. did you use when you were racing? Well, Emma's absolutely right. And it's one of those things that is trainable, like learning to suffer. So the yeah. more often that you try and do it, the better you'll get at doing that. And also actually it's been proven that the fitter you get, the better you are at suffering as well. Yeah. So I yeah. persevere with it yeah. and trust in the fact that the more often you do it, the better you're going to get yeah. at doing it. And I'm actually reading a book at the moment about um, about how to suffer, basically, and how to push through in races. And it is fascinating. There's a loads of different ways of thinking about it. But some people find that um, goal setting really helps. And you know, like visualizing, like sort of breaking the challenge down into little chunks and just focusing on the next one. Some people that's a terrible idea and it makes it worse. And for some people, so for some people, um, they need to zone out from the race and the pain, think about something else almost um, and some people just need to focus on it and almost um, almost sort of suck up the pain and really want it so uh, there are many different techniques you probably need to read up on those techniques and practice them yourself and find out which one works best for you yeah everyone has their own way of functioning and their own coping mechanisms so good luck good luck with that and let us know Now we come to our Zwift winner question. Uh, Jonathan Evans is a lucky viewer who wins three months free Zwift subscription and he asks uh, I ride with mates at the weekend and put in a couple of hours training during the week on the turbo. As I don't have a whole lot of time, would my time on the turbo be best spent on interval training or am I better just having fun chasing PRs on swift segments? My aim is both to stay fit and also increase my FTP so I can climb hills and sprint to road signs faster. Thank you. Well, I share your goals, Jonathan. Well, that's a good question for a start. And yep. if Emma shares your goals, then it's definitely a good one. <laughs> so with limited to time to train during the week, you want to make sure that you're making them effective and you'll need to include some intensity. And one of the best ways to do that is if you're saying you've got two hours available, you want to try and split those sessions. So yep. let's assume that that is possible for you. And then you'll want to include some really high quality workouts. So you'll need one structured session with some intervals and that'll give you an opportunity to really like push and increase your threshold, you know, which is great for climbing yeah. and things like and that. And there are loads and loads of sessions on Zwift for this and you've got a huge choice, which is fantastic. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier actually to yeah. break it down and, yeah. and decide what you're going to do. Um, the second thing you want to do is then aim to work on the high intensity, but with less structure, you know, so it stays mentally a little bit fresher and you can yep. kind of enjoy it more. So things like taking part in the Zwift races that yep. they now do is a great way of doing that. Yep. And we've seen James and Oscar do that, haven't we? Yeah, I did my first Zwift race uh, quite recently, actually. I got dropped on the last lap. I was a bit upset uh, on a hill of all things. Uh, and I thought that the hill was going to be the best bit for me. But no, it was really hard. And the great thing is that it's, it's it was an hour of really quite intense work. So it was super intense training, but I didn't, it didn't feel like... Like mentally as draining as it does to go out on the road and push hard on your own for an hour. So super time efficient, you know, less time sorting out bikes and stuff than going out on the road and an hour of really good quality workout that didn't feel mentally as tiring. It was quite exciting and yeah. fun. Yeah, that's good. And if you make the other session, that really structured, dedicated session yep. that's, yep. you know, really goal oriented, yep. then you yeah. get a good balance throughout the week. Yeah, and those those two quality sessions, are, I mean, with, with limited time, you, you can't do much more than that in a week anyway. So that's actually perfect to balance out with your weekend more, more fun riding where, you know, if you're doing a longer ride with your friends, you're not getting as much intensity, except apart from sprinting for those road signs, obviously. So it's probably quite a good balance, even on quite a small amount of time. Good luck. Our next question comes in from Lorenzo Rella, and he asks, hashtag talkback. It is not hard to see pro mechanics adjust riders' bikes in the middle of the race, hanging from the car without stopping. So why are they always sitting behind the passenger seat and not behind the driver? The majority of adjustable things on a bike are on its right side. Good question. Yeah, and it's true. Most of the things are on the right hand side. So with that in mind, it's actually easier for the rider to hold onto the car, at which point he's then able to maintain the same distance from the car. Yeah. A mechanic can reach up and over whilst also holding onto the rider himself. It's a little bit ungainly. And then adjust things without pushing the rider away from him constantly. So that's a lot easier. Yeah. He'll also sit behind the or opposite the driver, so not on the same side as the driver, so that he can actually see through what's going on. Yeah, so then always, he knows yeah. when the rider's there. They always there. take the headrest off the passenger seat so the mechanic can see what's coming up as well because it's very useful for the mechanic to see crashes ahead and see what's happening. Um, also probably so they don't get car sick. And yeah. because it's very boring sat in the back of a car in a race if you can't see what's happening in the race. And finally, normally you'll pull over to the right hand side of the road if you stop. So when the car opens, you don't want to be opening your car door into moving traffic. Uh, into the race, which yeah. is a car door a rider, which is really bad form. So yeah, 
It is actually, a, well, obviously, it's a really hard job being a race mechanic. They basically have to be sprinters and amazing mechanics, as they have to, you know, when they see a rider holding up a wheel, they have to be able to dash out there as quick as possible. Yeah. And don't panic. Yeah, and don't fall in a ditch. I've seen mechanics injured by falling <laughs> into ditches. It's a bloody hard job, yeah. Anyway, if you, if you want to see more about being a mechanic in a race, you can uh, check out this video here, which is uh, a day at the tour in the Mavic, Mavic neutral service car. Which is very exciting, so I got to sit in with Mavic. Easy TDI, just finished my first summer of easy coffee run group rides and I want to train hard this winter to come back much faster next year. I've got my VO2 max estimate for my Garmin and it's rather disappointingly low at 47. Is it low because I have not done much hard training in the past or will I expect that to go up this winter? And how would I best go about doing that? Well, first of all, don't panic. I mean, your VO2 will probably have dropped if you spent whole whole summer doing easy rides and not doing any hard training. Don't worry, there is good news, although also kind of bad news. The good news is that you can improve your VO2 max through training up to a certain limit, but if you haven't been training hard, you definitely haven't reached that limit. So there's loads of scope for improvement. Bad news is it's gonna take some hard, painful training sessions to make those improvements. But that's okay, because we're bike riders and we love pain, right? Apparently. Anyway, yeah, we've sometimes. got- Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> on a good day. We've yeah. got a good video though, with Dan and Sai telling you exactly the sort of intervals that you want to be doing. So probably worth checking that one out. Check that out, I probably should as well. Our second session is a little bit simpler, but no less painful. We're doing four minutes almost at max. So power meter users, that means again, about 120% of your FTP. Either way, when you get to the end of your first four minutes, you should feel that you have a little bit left in the tank, but not very much. Now we come to the quick for her round, so hold on tight, it's gonna be fast. First question is from Disgruntled Tunes, who asks, what's a good strategy for introducing children to cycling? Hashtag talkback. I suspect this might be worth an entire video. Chris, how do you introduce your children to cycling? Well, I had a brilliant answer until you said what you thought was the best way to do it, and that was just ban them from cycling. Yeah, I reckon kids, they love a little bit of rebellion, especially if it was teenagers, I'd say forbidden to cycle, and then they'll really want to. Yeah, failing that though, you could just introduce them to the shiny pictures and videos that we have on the channel, because, well, that's what everyone likes is about cycling, isn't it, originally? Beautiful sunshine. Yeah. Stunning bikes, that sort yep. of thing. But and then take yeah. them out on the bike, perhaps somewhere yeah. quiet, like a park. Yeah. I think the key thing is it's got to be fun, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. you don't really want to be forcing your children to take up cycling. I think a lot of my friends' kids who see their parents loving cycling, they automatically want to take up cycling because they see how fun it is. Yeah. But uh, I think that pressurising children to do a sport or anything else for that matter is it's probably not great, unless it's homework, which everyone has to do. But um, yeah. give them the opportunities and, and let them enjoy it and make it fun. Yeah, my kids did exactly that. Like, yeah. they took up cycling because they saw that I enjoyed it, so they yeah. wanted to do it as well. Yeah, there you Easy. go. Just have to be a perfect role model. Next question comes from Aaron, who asks, I'm relatively new to the world of structured bike training, and I was wondering if it was reasonable to do various months' long structured training plans year-round until I can get as fit as my physiology and mental commitment will allow. Should there be a couple of weeks in between plans? Love the show. That's a great question, Aaron. And the answer is quite simple you can't continually train without taking rest, as it's those rest weeks that allows your body to adapt and actually get stronger. So two to three weeks of building an increased load or intensity, and then a week to recover and kind of absorb those efforts. Yep. Easy. Next up, we have Eric Matton Icken. How do the ye how do your years, so your age, have an effect on cycling? Does age matter in cycling? Thank you for the answer. Well, yeah, age does matter, I'm afraid, but less than you might think, because cycling, for most of us road cyclists, it is an endurance sport and your endurance gets better as you get older. So there are actually some very successful pros still racing into their 40s. For example, uh, there's plenty of men, but there's also, for example, Chris Armstrong, who won her last gold medal at the Olympics in the, her 40s. Quite a good example. Um, and there's plenty of 60 year olds, 70 year olds still super strong on the bike. What you might find though, is that um, the balance of your physiological um, strength changes. So people normally, the sprinting gets weaker as they get older because your muscle strength generally tails off as you get older, um, but your endurance gets better. So um, older athletes, older cyclists should try and uh, do more strength training, basically. Oh, there you go, that's a good answer to that. Tommy Tom writes in, 
Do cyclists carry on shaving their legs in the winter over the winter months when they wouldn't be wearing shorts? Well, I do. I don't know about you. What do you do, Chris? Yeah, I do. I don't yeah. think my wife would let me in the house if I didn't. If you didn't shave your legs? Yeah, it looks so weird when you shave them year round and then all of a sudden you yeah. grow hairy legs. Well, personally, I think that if I can be bothered to shave my legs, then my partner should as well. So I hope he's listening. <laughs> Next question from Dennis Syke. Is it better to buy a pre-built bike or build your own? That's a really good question and one you should probably ask the tech channel, but you'll probably get better value for money if you buy a pre-built one. However, you can completely customise it if you build it yourself. Yeah, and you also have to have the skills, obviously, to well, build yeah. yourself. If you enjoy the project, then it's a good way to spend your time. Uh, next question, Dan Bates. Uh, is ETAP worth it? Ooh. I'm going to answer that one with simply, surely it is, because imagine life with no cables. Yeah, I find um, electronic shifting, for all everyone says it doesn't make you faster, I definitely prefer it. Small hands, less force needed, love it. Yeah, especially in the winter where you can't feel your fingers anymore. Yeah. Right then, Nick Bond, I have an old set of rollers and I'm looking to use a smart trainer on the cheap in the spring. Is it possible to train on basic rollers? Well, yeah, you can definitely train on them. People did for many, many decades. Um, it's especially good for high cadence work and to try and train a smooth pedaling technique. Um, they're also kind of a bit more interesting than a static trainer because you've got that added thrill of, am I going to fall off? Um, the only thing is that, of course, you can't really add resistance to rollers. So, um, you can add a little bit more resistance by reducing the tire pressure, but basically you're stuck to spinning. And if you want to do intervals, you're doing super high cadence intervals because yep. you can't add, in, uh, add any resistance. So. You buy the rollers, Emma? I have done. I'm not saying I can now, but I had to at a certain point. Like it, well, you just don't strum it as a track rider. Which is no, I'm not a track rider. I had to in uh, in Beijing before the between road race and time trial. We didn't have any turbos for some reason, and. Uh, the mechanic, bless him, held the back of my bike while I got going and promised he would hold it for the whole session. And uh, and so I could do my, my training session on the rollers. And then uh, I looked around about halfway through and he'd gone. And I was balancing all on my own and I was so freaked out I fell off. Uh, that sounds like everyone's introduction <laughs> to rollers. Right then, uh, Cyclone Fruit Bat. I'm guessing that's not your real name. <laughs> After rides, the muscles in between my shoulder blades are always tight. How can I fix this? Well, um, you can do some stretching and check your position. It might be that you're holding your shoulders funny on the bike. And if you're also carrying too much weight on your arms, so if your handlebars are really low and your seat's far forward, then that's gonna really stress the muscles in your back. But lightly, it sounds like you've got a funny shoulder position. Um, so I'd look at, definitely look at your position. And then to loosen the muscles off once they've got sore, um, you could try um, using a tennis ball and putting it between your back and a wall and rolling it around. That works pretty well for easing off tight back muscles. Yeah, definitely. Happy Face asks, uh, when riding over five hours, how important is it to use electrolyte replacement tabs in one of your bottles? Similarly, how much should I be using? Well, that's a really good question. Answer is quite dependent though. So it depends on how much you sweat personally, but also how hot it is where you're riding and the intensity of the ride you're doing, more so than the duration of your ride. Um, you can test all of those things. Well, you can certainly test how far and intensely you're riding, but you can also test your sweat rate. So it's worth researching that online and having a go. Yep. TB0 writing, how can I balance my training with school? How can I make sure that my training is actually enough? Right, well, uh, unless you're a teacher, TB0, uh, the chances are that if you're still at school age, you don't really need to be doing much more than six to eight hours a week because you're still growing and developing. So you don't want to overdo it. Um, but it is a great age to build cycling skills um, and a base for later. Um, so skills on the bike comfort, pedaling technique, all these things, sprinting, but you definitely don't need to be doing many hours. I think there's a danger if you do too much too young that you can actually um, do yourself a bit of harm. So yeah. um, concentrate on high quality, but also having fun and those skills that I wish I had learned as a kid, but I didn't ride a bike as a kid. So I uh, can't do a wheelie, can't do a track stand. It's, it's a great time to be like getting comfortable riding in a group as well. Yep. Like yep. most kids, you know, most of the pros that you see were pro, um, great bike riders when they were kids. And that's because they met up with the mates and they went out yeah. and they pushed each other's limits, not just physically, but you know, technically yeah. as well. You learn to ride in a peloton, on a wheel, all that stuff. Hopefully you found some of these answers useful. And if you have any of your own questions, remember to drop them in the comments below and use the hashtag AskGCNTraining. For that chance to win three months subscription on Zwift, which is pretty awesome. Or you can use the hashtag TalkBack uh, if it's not a training question. You can give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And if you'd like to see a video about why power to weight is actually rubbish, you can click down here.